shall we rise up to pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for bringing us here today. Thank you for all the locations where we have the Bible study. And thank you because your people have come with hearts open to receive from you. And we pray that nobody will be disappointed in Jesus' name. We're just praying, Lord, that your hand will be upon every one of us. That we have proper understanding of your word even tonight in Jesus' name. I will pray that this word will strengthen us and prepare us for the challenges ahead of us in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, as we're eager to learn, eager to know. We pray, Lord, we'll be as eager to practice the word you're teaching us every time in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to keep on standing on this word of truth, the word of life that you are teaching us. That, Lord, our profiting in the word will be known to everybody around us in Jesus' name. Amen. Strengthen your people tonight. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You can be seated. We come to our Bible study once again tonight. And we're looking at Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, we're actually looking at it from verse 9, all through verse, all through to verse 12. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye. What men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you were still in the beatitudes and in the beatitudes we're looking at these verses of scriptures today I want to remind you once again that these are the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has been telling us and painting the picture of the blessed man, the blessed woman, that is the believer, the child of God for us. And as he traces the path of blessedness, he has told us, number one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Actually, that's where to start. You cannot jump the fence and come out just say blessed are the peacemakers you're going to have a wrong idea a false idea who those peacemakers are if you don't start from verse 3 but you see when you start from verse 3 first of all you come into the kingdom and as you come into the kingdom you know that he's talking to citizens of the kingdom how do you become a citizen of the kingdom you realize you're a sinner you repent of your sins and then you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because he came to take away our sins. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because of that you now have a name that is your citizen of the kingdom of God. And then he says, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. After you are born again, it's possible that you might be surprised that there is temptation. that temptation if you happen to fall to such temptation what you'll do is to mourn for your sin and to mourn for your carelessness because of that mourning you're sorry for what you have done you go back to the cleansing blood of the lamp again and it cleanses you all over again in that cleansing there is comfort it comforts you because now you receive that forgiveness again that pardon again, that grace again, that reunion with the Lord again, and with the united fellowship of the Lord, now you rejoice in the comfort of the pardon, of the forgiveness of the Lord. But not only that you mourn for your mistake, mourn for your foolishness, mourn for your carelessness, and mourn for your sin if you happen to sin, and then you get forgiveness, you mourn for the sins of other people. As you look all around you, 
and you see the wickedness of man and the hatred of man and the foolishness of man and the rejection of Christ then you mourn because of that in that morning you don't lock yourself and just say you are mourning you go out and you talk to the people that are kneeling Christ or the cross again and then as they are being converted and the Lord is answering your prayer then you are rejoicing because in the conversion of the people you are praying for you are being comforted and then it goes on to say blessed are the meek remember you are poor in spirit and remember you mourn for sin and remember now after all that has been done you are meek you are lowly you are gentle these are the characteristics and the qualities of the people in the kingdom it says for they shall inherit the earth then it says blessed are they which do thirst hunger and thirst at a righteousness for they shall be filled that means then after you are born again you'll not just read satisfied folding your hand i've got it all because i got saved do you know brothers and sisters there are many people in this in this world in fact in the church world that feel that after you are saved you have got it all they know nothing about the righteousness of god about the purity of heart about the holiness experience or about sanctification they feel i'm saved i'm saved i'm through i've got everything i will ever get but the lord is saying after you've got the initial experience and you're born again you are washing the blood of the lamb and there's a joy of salvation in your heart then you're still panting you are longing you are desiring and you're thirsty and hungry for that righteousness which is of god that's why it says blessed are they which do thirst which do hunger and thirst at a righteousness for they shall be filled and then blessed are the merciful blessed are the merciful you know the tendency after you are saved after you have been purified and now you are living the righteous life by the grace of god it's likely that you have you become impatient with the people who are not running as fast as you are running uh, with the people who are not reading the bible who do not understand the word of god as much as you understand the word of god and therefore because of that tendency that's what the lord is telling us are you saved praise the lord and are you sanctified praise the lord have you been filled with the righteousness of god praise the lord but don't forget blessed are the meek in the experiences you have you say become patient humble lowly and meek with other people that's why it says blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy and then blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god i pray we'll see god but you know if we're going to see god here today and we're going to see god in eternity it takes purity of heart it takes that experience of sanctification that's why the bible says follow peace with all men and uh, holiness without which no man shall see the lord now at all those wonderful experiences it now tells us something very important in verse 9 blessed are the peacemakers blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of god you see these qualities we have they are the things that mark out the children of god how do you know a child of god because anybody can just rise up and say i'm a child of god i'm born again and i have christ living inside me how can you prove that is right because you cannot see inside him how can you prove that he's wrong because you cannot see whether he has christ in him or not but this is the practical thing that is very evident blessed are the peacemakers because they shall be called the children of god you you can tell whether he's a peace loving child of god whether he's a peace making child of god or whether he loves conflict and if, if he loves conflict you know who he's related with because christ is a prince of peace and if he on the other hand he loves conflict and fighting and hatred 
and violence and he is you know he has practiced boxing and he puts that boxing into practice and he knocks everybody down whenever they disagree with him you can tell who is related with but if we're children of god it says this is the evidence and this is the the visible thing we can see blessed are the peacemakers because they shall be called the children of god and then he tells us even after you are being a peacemaker you know there are many people that think if i am very nice and i'm very good and i have the fruit of the spirit the love and the joy and the peace and the patience that's long suffering and the gentleness and the meekness and the faithfulness if i have those qualities of the fruit of the spirit then everybody is going to accept me everybody is going to love me well but you need to ask yourself a question didn't jesus christ the prince of peace they want the one who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil didn't he have all those qualities of love of joy of peace of long suffering of meekness of gentleness of faithfulness of course he had the qualities did they all love him did they all accept him and did they all res did they all respect him of course no that means then even though we may have all these qualities of character and we may have the evidence of grace in our lives that does not mean that everybody in the world is going to accept you appreciate you have affection for you and you think about all the people in the word of god john the beloved you know children love one another and he's the one that told us for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life he spoke about love and love and love every time you are going to think anybody talking about love every time demonstrating that love every time everybody will rally around him like the flies run after the after the honey but not like that you remember that john the beloved was put in a boiling oil in a pot of boiling oil why because there's persecution persecution for the righteous persecution for the children of god that's why jesus christ said blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake oh you see if uh, you know if they are being persecuted maybe there's something wrong in their lives maybe they are not actually practicing that word that word of god the way they ought to practice jesus said no for the righteousness that they manifest and for the life of purity for the life of holiness they demonstrate that's the reason why they are being persecuted it says blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven then it says blessed are ye when men shall revile you now it says you are persecuted in verse 10 and it says in verse 11 you are reviled that means they'll belittle you they will insult you they are cast as passions on you they'll call you nicknames bad names that will be very very painful that's reviling they'll abuse you they'll insult you that's a persecution and it says you are blessed when you do that and they persecute you and it shall say all manner of evil against you falsely do you know anybody who has run away from the church because uh, you know somebody told lies against him and he said something false about him and he said me i'm a child of god i am righteous and this and that and they could tell such lies against me all right there's no point anymore living a righteous life if i have done the best i could do and they still tell these lies against me no way i'm not going to remain a christian anymore they didn't read their bibles because Jesus said, Blessed are you when they shall say all manner of evil against you for my sake. Then he said, Rejoice. It is a cry. He said, Rejoice. It is a give up. He said, Rejoice. It is a get discouraged. He said, Rejoice. It is a abandon the face. He said, when you are persecuted like that and your righteousness is called to question and your stand for the Lord is called to question. He said, rejoice. Then he tells us what, what, what to rejoice. In fact, he said, be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. I pray God will reward you. Yeah. But you know, if you are persecuted and then you run away from the church, where's the reward? How are you going to get the reward? If you are persecuted and you abandon the faith, 
Are you going to be rewarded? If a little insult, a little abuse, a little opposition, a little persecution make you crumble, and then you are discouraged, and then there is no faith anymore, how are you going to get your reward? That's exactly what the devil wants to do. After you have gone through quite, quite a lot in your life, after you have endured quite a lot in your life, the devil wants you to give up, but you will not give up. Yeah. I said you will not give up. Yeah. Because it says, great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You are in good company when they persecute you. Because you are just counted like those prophets of old. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, the practice of peace making children of God. The practice of peace making children of God. Number two, the persecution of peaceful children of God. The persecution of peaceful children of God. Number three, the profit of persecuted children of God. The profit of persecuted children of God. Let's come to number one. The practice of peace making children of God. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. He says blessed that word blessed, I'm sure you know. It means happy. It means fortunate. It means favored. Favored, fortunate, happy, blessed are the peacemakers because they shall be called the children of God. The true child of God is a peacemaker. Check up your own life. The true child of God is a peacemaker. Anywhere you see conflict, Anywhere you see disunity, anywhere, anywhere you see discord, anywhere you see contention, anywhere you see problem, if you have the nature of Christ in you, you want to be a problem solver. And as you think about it, the privilege, the opportunity of solving problems, that you will find everywhere. And people have problems. Problems in relationship. You know, men have problems with God because they're sinners. And they turn their backs against God. And you are reconciling God with man. Or man with God. Because you are a peacemaker. And there are families. There are problems there. You have husband and wife. There are problems. Challenges. And they turn their backs at one another. If you are a peacemaker, you will be reconciling the husband with the wife. Parents and children. There are times there are problems. And the parents say, I don't want to see that child. Not in this house anymore. And the, and the child is throwing stones back to the house. And if you are a child of God, what are you doing? You are making peace between them. Reconciling the children with the parents. In-laws have problems with their son-in-law, daughter-in-law. If you are a child of God, the opportunity is there every time. And landlords have problems with their, with their, with their tenants. And if you are a child of God, you are not increasing the problem. You are not contributing to the problem. You are contributing to the solution because it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. A child of God will love peace, will desire peace, will promote peace, will work for peace, will pray for peace, and it will do everything to maintain peace among men. Actually, if you're a real child of God, you hate discord. You detest it. You are poor it, and you shun it at all costs, and you hate anything that will bring discord or division among the people of God. Real children of God will labor with all their might to prevent the fire of contention from being kindled. And where that fire is already kindled, you will do everything you can to calm the stormy spirits of men and to quiet in the turbulent passion and soften the minds of contending parties and reconcile people one to another. Uh, because of the importance of this section, uh, let me just go through one by one. Number one, the model for peacemakers. Because it says, blessed are the peacemakers. Can we point to the model? And then we can say, if I'm going to be a, a peacemaker, here is my model. And here is the example that I'm to follow. Number one then, the model for peacemakers in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I'm reading to you from verse 20. Colossians chapter 1 verse 20. 
here it says and having made peace made peace peacemakers who are peacemakers the peacemakers are those who make peace and here we're told of jesus christ the prince of peace our model in peacemaking it says and having made peace through the blood of his cross we learn something here it takes sacrifice to make peace it takes sacrifice to to make peace if you are not willing to sacrifice anything from yourself even your very blood you cannot be a peacemaker you know, if you are full of self and full of vain glory and full of whatever you want and full of whatever you desire and full of wanting recognition and full of wanting the praise of men you'll never be a peacemaker you see the the, the model for peacemakers the lord jesus christ were told he made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him i say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven and you will see uh, who that was sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked words yet now i still reconcile who are we reconciling? Are we reconciling friends that have no problems together? Of course, no. We're reconciling people that have problems with one another. They are alienated from one another. They are enemies to one another. Those are the people we're making the peace for or making the peace with in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 18. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18. Here is what it says. And all things of God. Who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So then, number one. The model for peacemakers. The Lord Jesus Christ. Anytime you see conflict anywhere, disagreement anywhere, disunity anywhere, discord anywhere, and misunderstanding anywhere, you ask yourself, what will Christ do? Because Christ is a model, and he is a peacemaker. Will he rejoice because there is contention? Will he make the enemies to become um, avowed enemies of one another? Or will he try to bring them together and bring love in their midst? Then what Jesus will do is what he will do. And now we're introduced to another thing, number two, the ministry of peacemaking. The ministry of peacemaking. Right in that verse I read to you, it says in that verse 18, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That means then reconciliation is a ministry by itself. Peacemaking is a ministry by itself. The ministry of peacemaking. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 15. Ephesians chapter 2. Reading from verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man so making peace making peace peacemakers making peace and so you see the ministry and this is what the lord jesus christ himself this is what he carried out and that he might reconcile both unto god in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby what do we do in the ministry of reconciliation in the ministry of peacemaking we're removing the enmity between those two people when we're witnessing when we're preaching the gospel when we're winning souls to the lord what are we doing we're removing the enmity between that sinner and the almighty god is enmity against god is hatred towards the commandment of god that's what we're removing and we're doing everything we can that the enmity between man and God were removing it. That's what you call soul winning. But it's the ministry of peacemaking is a ministry of reconciliation. And when husband and wife, when they have offended one another, and then they have allowed that offense to get in between them, and it drives a wedge in between them, and they say, please pack your load and go. I don't want to see you anymore. If I don't marry in my life, I know I'm not married, get away from here. You know, that's enmity. And that wedge that is in between them. And you have a ministry of reconciliation. 
what's that ministry you want to go there and you want to do everything you can do in that ministry of peacemaking to remove the enmity in between them uh, two brothers are working together and they love one another they put their capitals together they are trading together or they do whatever together and then something happened among them something always happens because there's a devil in the world and uh, one of them said now we cannot work together again and while they are arranging that one of the other fellow became cunning clever crafty and then he went to take all the money maybe from their account and now he says okay we're separating now are we going to separate like that how about the money am i going to go empty handed and go anywhere you want and now what do we do we want to remove the enmity in between them, reconcile them, bring them together. That is the ministry and blessed are the peacemaker for this shall be called the children of God. Number three, the message of peacemakers. The message of peacemakers. Now, if you are to be a peacemaker, see that two people are having disagreement. Two people are fighting. Two people are having discord. Two people are having contention. Two people are throwing stones at one another. Let's say you want to be a peacemaker. And then you just go there looking at their faces. Folding your hands. Not saying anything. No, you have to say something. Because if you are going to reconcile them, it's the word you say that will suit their, uh, their attention. And suit their nerves. That will make them to turn their faces one towards the other. You have a message. You have something to say. The peacemaker has a message. Number three then. The message of peacemakers. And we're looking at Genesis chapter 13 verse 8. Genesis chapter 13. And I'm reading to you from verse 8. And Abraham said unto Lord. Let there be no strife. I pray thee between me and thee, and between the head men and, the, and, and the, my head men and the head men, for we be brethren. That's the message. You are telling them, are we not of the same blood, the blood of Jesus Christ? Have we not been reconciled unto God? Don't we believe the Bible? Isn't Jesus Christ our Savior, the Prince of Peace? Should we continue like this? What message are we giving to the world? We are brethren. And because we are brethren, there should be no strife. There should be no contention. Because we are related to God, you are related to God, I am related to God. How can two people have been the same father? How can two people have been the same savior? How can two people go into the same heaven? How can two people believe in the same doctrine? How can two people believe in that we need God and this is the commandment of God? How can those two people be so much against one another and we cannot even talk together at all? You have a message. It must be a convincing message. It must be a convicting message that you are telling them. And as you tell them, by the grace of God, with prayer, I believe that they are going to be reconciled together in Jesus' name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the message of peacemakers. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading to you from verse 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, here is the message the Lord has for those people that have uh, so much against one another and they feel that the only thing they can do is to continue that hatred and to be torn apart there are any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints you have a matter against one another the the peacemakers are not in the world because those peacemakers, if you're a peacemaker, so if you're a peacemaker, you're a child of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Therefore, where do we find the children of God? In the house of God, in the temple of God, in the family of God. If those, if those people are there, if they were true peacemakers, they'll be here. Because the peacemakers are children of god anyone who is not a child of god cannot be a real peacemaker and therefore he says there are any of you having something against another you'll go to the people the unjust who are not children of god and not before the saints the children of god do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world and if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that 
we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life if then ye have judgments of things pertaining to the to this life set them to judge set them to counsel set them to mediate who are who are the least esteemed in the church i speak to your shame is it so that there is not a wise man among you no not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren but brother goes to law goes to the court it was brother and that before the unbelievers now therefore there is certainly a fault among you because ye go to law one uh, against one with the other with another why do ye not rather take wrong why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded that's the message of the peacemaker that even if you have to be cheated you have to take it because you want to do this to prove that you're a real child of god number four mediation by peacemakers mediation by peacemakers you know and when we say we're making peace you are mediating you are coming in between two people and with one hand you hold the hand of one with the other hand you hold the hand of the other and then you pull those two hands together to reconcile them we are mediating and uh, if we're going to be peacemakers actually that is the motive the motive of peacemaking what's the motive the motive is to mediate is to come in between two people reconcile them together in first samuel chapter 19 for samuel chapter 19 i'm reading from verse 1 in verse 1 and so speak to jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill david here we find saul on the one hand david on the other hand and saul wanted to kill david obviously there's conflict here obviously there's there was hatred and and jonathan saw that and jonathan now was going to be a peacemaker what was he going to do as a peacemaker he will mediate he will come in between them he will talk to one about the other he'll talk to the other about this other one and see how to bring them together look at verse 4 and jonathan spake good of david unto saul jonathan spoke good of david unto saul his father and said unto him let not the king sin against his servant against david and you will see the language of the peacemaker is is chosen carefully the language of the peacemaker is selected in a very careful way and uh, you know the words you're going to say to this one about the other fellow and you're not talking about things that are irrelevant and things that are not necessary and things that will not contribute to softening the mind of the person you are talking to uh, jonathan was talking to his father and said he spoke good of david uh, unto, unto Saul his father and said unto him let not the king sin against a servant he didn't say against my friend because Saul was not interested in the fact that David was his friend all he wanted to know is what's, how useful is this David what's he doing for me after all and what can I benefit from him and so he said against his servant David and then he said because he has not sinned against against thee and because his words have been toward thee very good for he put his life in his hand and he slew the philistine and the lord wrought a great salvation for all israel thou sawest it and didst rejoice wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay david without a cause and Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swear, as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. Do you see this? To rescue one life, and to preserve the life, and to remove the enmity, and to change the mind of Saul, and to change the mind of uh, this fellow that wanted to kill the other. And Jonathan called David. And Jonathan showed him all those things. You are speaking to both sides. You are showing the truth to both sides. And Jonathan brought David to Saul. And he was in his presence as in times past. That's reconciliation. That's peacemaking. That's mediation. Mediation between two people. Number five, the mind of peacemakers. The mind. What kind of mind? 
does the peacemaker have? The mind of peacemakers. In Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 7. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. And you realize that if you yourself, you don't have peace in your own mind. You have your own conflict. You have your own trouble. And let's say, for example, uh, somebody sees a family, the husband and the wife, they're about to divorce. And they're, you know, they, they're, almost, they're fighting, beating one another, biting one another. And they, they want to scatter the family, share the children. You go with the boys, I go with the girls. And then this other fellow looks at that family, he wants to mediate. He wants to bring them together. He wants to be a peacemaker. Meanwhile, in his own family, he's not having a, a peaceful relationship with his own wife. And he's not at peace with his own children. And his mind also is scattered. And, you know, they don't sleep all throughout the night. He himself has sleepless nights because of worry, anxiety, that his wife is soon going to pack out. How can he, since he doesn't have peace in his own mind, how can he go and settle another person's family? Or let's say, for example, that, you know, here you have a church, a church location, and the pastor is having problem with members of his own church, and it's like, you know, the members are throwing stones, and, you know, we're not going to pay tithes and offering, we're fed up with this, we're going to vote out uh, that pastor, we don't want him as pastor again, enough is enough. And then he hears that, you know, there's another church uh, downtown there, they too, they are having the same, uh, you know, katakata among them. And the same palaver. And he says, okay, I'm going to be a peacemaker. Meanwhile, the other church downtown, uh, they are hearing a story about his own church, that he too is having problem. And then he goes and says, how are you there? Oh, they say, how are you there too? I hear that you have problems. Oh, they say, yes, the same kind of problem that you have. You know, he will not be able to make peace in that church. If you're going to be a peacemaker in your own mind, you must have peace also. In your own heart, you must have peace also. The peace of God must settle in your own heart. That's why it says here that the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through, G through Christ Jesus. Verse, verse 8, uh, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which ye have both learned and received and, uh, and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. You have to be at peace yourself in your family before you can go and reconcile families that are having problems. You have to be at peace with your own friends before you can go to make peace with the friends who are having disagreements together. You have to be at peace in yourself, in your house, in every way before you can be an agent of peace to other people. Number, number six, the method of peacemakers the method of peacemakers as you come to you know make peace and then you say you need to reach some conclusions and what conclusion are you making we're looking at genesis chapter 31 genesis chapter 31 i'm reading from verse 36 genesis chapter 31 reading from verse 36 and jacob was wroth and church with laban and, uh, and, and Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin? That thou hast so hotly pursued after me. You know, there was a problem there. Because uh, Laban and Jacob, uh, they had some disagreement. And you see the way Jacob spoke. And then eventually you look at verse 43. In verse 43, and Laban answered and said unto Jacob, These daughters uh, are my daughters. And these children are my children, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. And what can I do this day unto these my daughters, and unto their children which they have born? And then in verse 44, now therefore, come, come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. You know, you cannot fight all your life. Life is short. 
You are going to you need to enjoy your life, enjoy relationships, enjoy friendship, enjoy you know what God has provided for you. But if from morning till night and from day to day and week to week and month to month and year after year it's just conflict and fighting and all that and you're fighting the day and, and by the way when you're fighting the day like that when you sleep you'll be fighting in your dream and then you'll be sweating because you'll be running up they're chasing me they're chasing me because you know you are chasing them in the afternoon and day two they are chasing you in the night and when you are like that in the day and in the night, you'll have hypertension. You'll not be able to live long. You'll not have peace of mind. You'll not have long life. A time then comes in your life when you say, enough is enough. There's going to be peace. And if there's going to be peace, what's the message? What's the conclusion? And what are you eventually saying? Let's look at verse 52. This heap be witness and this pillar be witness that i will not pass over this heap to thee and that thou shalt not pass over this heap that means unto me and this uh, this pillar unto me for harm eventually they came together they say let's let, let's raise up a method and the method is this let's have something visible something tangible and we put it here and this is the witness that now we have resolved our conflict. We have ended all the war, all the battle, all the fighting. Every time we come over here and we see this sign, and we see this pillar, and we see this heap, we'll remember the covenant we have made together. We have made peace. We have resolved everything. I will not pass over this place to come and harm you. You will not pass over this place to come and harm me that is the bottom line the summary of peacemaking that you make up your mind he makes up his mind you'll not cross fire and you'll not cross any boundary to harm one another number one the, the model of peacemakers for peacemakers number two the ministry of peacemaking number three the message of peacemakers number four the mediation which is a motive by peacemakers number five the mind of peacemakers number six the method of peacemakers number seven mistakes in peacemaking mistakes in peacemaking peace is wonderful peace is good if both of us are sincere if both of us are truthful peace is a wonderful thing if both of us mean exactly what we say but um, you know that uh, there are people that are not sincere. In fact, you'll find the epitome or the climax of that in the personality of the Antichrist. In Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 25. Daniel chapter 8 verse 25. And through his policy shall he cause Christ to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but shall be broken without hand. That's talking about the Antichrist. And you know the, the Antichrist. Uh, by the way, uh, I don't know whether you have heard from the people of the world. The people of the world, uh, they, I think they are afraid. And they're thinking about, you know, tomorrow. Today is the 5th of June. Tomorrow is the 6th of June. And tomorrow you have 6, 6, 6. That's 6 of June, 2006. And right out there in the world, in the West, as well as in Africa here, they're concerned. There are people that are shivering because of 666. And they don't know what to make of tomorrow. But, you know, we are relaxed because Jesus said the rapture will take place first. After that, the great tribulation. And you and I, we're still here. The rapture has not taken place. I said the rapture has not taken place. Because if the rapture has taken place, what are we doing here at the Bible study? If the rapture takes place, you will be there, I will be there. And that's why we're not afraid. But you see, the people of the world, they don't understand. Therefore, they're thinking of tomorrow 666. And they say tomorrow is going to be a terrible time. With us, it is well. 
But you see, when the Antichrist eventually comes, that Antichrist, he will, he will say, I'm a peacemaker. I'm a peace lover. And then he will try to, you know, Israel is having problem with the, uh, with the Middle East. And then he will come as a person that loves peace. And he says, now, all this problem that America has not been able to resolve and Europe has not been able to resolve, I come as a peacemaker. And the United Nations will, you know, they rally around and they back up this Antichrist because it will be very crafty. It will be very clever. And it will maneuver everything to try to bring peace in the Middle East. And once the people of the world see that, they say, well, this is the Messiah. This is the real Christ, but is the Antichrist. That's why it says, through his policy, also, it shall cause craft, it shall cause the craftiness to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. And so as we talk about peace, we must be very, very careful. There are people that have the spirit of the Antichrist. And they are very cunning, they are very clever, they are very crafty. And we, you know, with craftiness and with the cunning and everything, they'll smile a lot, they'll appear gentle, they appear very peaceful. But the evil, the evil intention is in their hearts. And if you just make the mistake and say, and you say, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And you do not find out by peace it shall destroy men. I'm reading from verse 21. Daniel chapter 11. Yeah. Look at, uh, uh, and his estate shall stand up. In his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. That's the Antichrist. He shall come peaceably. And so don't be fooled. Don't think that anybody, everybody that is speaking peaceably, very nice, very soft, they don't trace their voice, and they don't show anger on their face, and they are, you know, very nice, nice people, gentle people. Oh, you see, that's what we studied at the Bible study the other time. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. No, you need to check up. Uh, have they turned away from their sin? Are they born again? Do they thirst after righteousness? Are they hungry after righteousness? Are they pure in heart? Do they believe the Bible, the doctrines of the Bible? So don't be swallowed in by their flatteries. Don't be swallowed in by their craftiness or cleverness. It tells us in verse 22, And when the arms of a flaw shall they be overflown eh, from before him, and shall be broken, and yea, they also the prince of the cup the prince of the covenant then it says and after the league after the covenant after the so-called peacemaking uh, made uh, with him he shall walk deceitfully be very careful of the people that say they are peace lovers they are making peace but they are deceitful and they are liars and they just want to deceive you into a wrong kind of relationship for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people he shall enter peacefully even upon the fattest places of the province and he shall do he shall do that which his father have not done nor his father's fathers he shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches yea he shall forecast his devices against the strong and uh, and a strong host even for a time i pray the lord will deliver us uh, let me show you an example of people having the spirit of that antichrist uh, and see the way they manipulated things so that you are not sucked into their system so you don't think everybody that is talking nice and talking peacefully that is talking well with you this is a peacemaker and we're told just to agree with everybody watch out are they born again watch out do they have purity of heart watch out are they intending to get to heaven watch out what's the real character genesis chapter 34 in genesis chapter 34 i'm reading from verse 13 genesis 34 verse 13 and the sons of jacob answered shaking and hamel his father deceitfully and said uh, and said because he had defiled dinah their sister and they said unto them we cannot do this thing 
to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised for that were a reproach unto us and then they said in verse 15 but in this we will consent unto you if ye will be if ye be as we be that every male of you be circumcised then will we give our daughters unto you and we will take your daughters to us and we will dwell with you and we will become one people you know that's the way they spoke and these people they thought this is a way to make peace look at verse 20 in verse 20 and Hamon shake him his son came to the to the gate of the city and communed with the men of their city saying these men are peaceable with us these men are peace lovers and they want to make peace with us they want to stay with us they want to live with us isn't it wonderful to have peaceful people like this they have been deceived and so you don't want any sinner to deceive you anyone that has a wrong intention to deceive you what, what they call peace you see it says these men are peaceable with us therefore let them dwell in the land and trade therein for the land behold it is large enough for them let us make their daughters to and uh, let us take their daughters to us for wives and let us give them our daughters and then it says in verse 24 and unto Hamon and unto Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of his city and every male was circumcised and all that went out of the gate of his city and it came to pass on the third day when they were sore that is when their pain the pain of the circumcision was very terrible on them that two of the sons of Jacob Simon and Levi Dinah said brethren took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males and they slew hammer and shake him his son on the edge of the sword you see that you would have thought the way they spoke let's live peaceably together we're going to be at peace they deceived them therefore as a people of god we read the whole bible we don't just read one part of the bible and say okay we're making peace we're making peace and the other fellow is not sincere and the other fellow is very deceitful and the other fellow doesn't have a heart for righteousness he just has the heart of the antichrist the attitude of the antichrist the spirit of the antichrist and because of that he is full of deception I pray God will deliver us. Amen. We come now to point number two. The persecution of peaceful children of God. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5 again. I'm reading from verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Then in verse 10, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven this is the kingdom of heaven then he tells us in verse 11 blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake here we are told about the persecution the lord jesus has been talking about these people again remember who these people are number one the poor in spirit Number two, they are, the, they, are, they are the people that mourn. Any little mistake, they are very sorrowful. If they are tempted and they yield to temptation, they are sorrowful. They go back to the cross to Calvary immediately. If other people are not obeying the Lord, it makes them very sorrowful. They love righteousness so much that any unrighteousness they see anytime, anywhere, no matter how small or how big, it really bothers them. You know, these people that love the Lord so much and they love the word of God so much, they just want everything that God wants. And then these are people that are thirsty and they are hungry after righteousness and they are being filled with righteousness. You will think, you know, once you are like that, righteous, and full of righteousness 
that there will be no problem at all, that, you know, everybody will just run around you. You'll be the pet of everyone, the favorite of everyone, the baby of everyone. But it's not always so. And then these are the people that are merciful. They are very kind. They are helping this one. They are buying something for this one. Anywhere they see suffering, they want to alleviate the suffering of other people. They go about like Jesus Christ, doing good because they are merciful and they are pure in heart. They have pure motive, pure intention. Anything they do, they do with pure intention. And then it says, these people are even peace-loving. They deserve peace. And they demand peace and they work for peace and they pray and labor for peace and they live peaceably with everyone are you not surprised in the next verse jesus would say that these same people he has been talking to they will be persecuted the question is why why will such people who love the lord who live for the glory of god why will they be persecuted let's look at galatians chapter 4 verse 29 galatians chapter 4 verse 29 here it tells us in verse 29 but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit as then when old testament time he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that is born after the spirit. Remember Cain and Abel, born of the flesh. Cain, born of the spirit. Abel, born of the flesh, persecuted the one born of the spirit. Do you remember Esau and Jacob? Persecution. He that is born of the flesh, persecuting he that is born of the spirit. Do you remember Pharaoh? And then the Israelites, born of the flesh, he that was born after the flesh, persecuting him, born after the spirit. Would you remember then Saul and David, he that was born of the flesh, persecuting him, that is born of the spirit. And then you come to the New Testament, and you will find that the people of God were persecuted by the religious people, but were not born again. If you are a persecutor, it shows that, you know, they say dog eat dog. That's dog. But you never hear sheep eat sheep. Never. Yes, unbelievers can ill treat themselves. Dog eating dog. But if you are persecuting another person who is a child of God, then the evidence is you are born of the flesh. Because he that is born after the flesh persecutes him that is born after the spirit. A child of God, a true child of God, will not persecute another child of God. I know what you are thinking about. Ah, but I want to leave the district because of brother so and so. Because you call him brother does not mean he's a child of God. I want to leave the environment here. And I, I will not live deeper life, but the pressure is too much. I cannot stay here. I cannot remain here. Since, uh, you know, something happened between me and that sister, between me and that brother, I've not found life easy in this place. Uh, if, you know, they trail me everywhere. The oppression is too much. And persecution is too much. I'm going to leave the district for them, but I'll not leave deeper life. The person who is persecuting another child of God, to the point the fellow is so fed up, he wants to run away. And he, in fact, if he dies, he says, God, come now. Let, let me just die. Go to heaven. The fellow that is persecuting him, making him to be fed of, up of life like that, that's not a child of God. He that is born of the flesh persecuteth him that is born of the spirit. I can imagine somebody calling another person and say, come here. In this district, as long as I'm here, listen to me very well. I don't do my own secret. As long as I am here, you'll never get married. Here. Anybody that can say that to another person, call him by any other title, call him by any name. That's not a child of God. That was so frightening and threatening and make life impossible for any other for another child of God. That's not Christianity. He that is born of the flesh is the one that persecutes him that is born of the spirit. And so you find it here. So if you're a persecutor, and you know when you persecute somebody, the fellow is confused. He doesn't know how to pray again. When he's coming to church, he's afraid. When we come to church, there should be joy in serving the Lord. 
we shall come to church this is the day the lord has made i'll be glad and rejoice in it i was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the lord we're coming to bible study in those days and we're running and they say where well, you run i'm going to bible it's the best day of our lives it's the best fellowship i can ever be it's a place of joy a place of renewal a place of gladness a place you, you don't you don't want to be you don't want to miss it at all you're going to the workers retreat you are so happy you are so joyful you're going to the best place in your life this is the place to be but if your presence in the church is making another person to feel I would have liked to go to the Bible, so but okay, I will go. But let them all sit down in the front. I saw that when they don't see me uh, there, they will know, they will see I'm not there. And then after everybody has sat down, the fellow will sneak in because he's afraid. How can you be afraid of the other children of God, of the people of God? If you are a child of God, you make life pleasant, life easy, life enjoyable, life happy for another child of God. And they will like to serve the Lord. But if they are running away from the Lord because of you, and they become panicky, they are worried, they are anxious, they are fearful because of you, because you are really putting some pressure on them. Check up your Christian experience. Only the people in the flesh persecute the people who are in the spirit. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. How are they going to suffer persecution? Look at verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. The people that persecute them, that make them, that make them feel afraid, feel under pressure, they are the evil men that are waxing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We're told in John chapter 15. John chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 18 john chapter 15 verse 18 here it says in verse 18 if the world hates you you know that it hated me before it hated you please listen to this if the world hates you not if the church hates you how can church hate church it's like you know can you imagine uh, christ calling john and say john and dear if peter persecutes you endure never can you imagine jesus calling james and saying now james you're going to follow me and you might you might face some challenges matthew may you know may really put some pressure on you but endure never matthew will not persecute john and peter will not persecute philip it's the world if the world hates you persecution comes from the world not from the church the church is a family can you think of a father persecuting his own child his own child i mean normal father reasonable father loving father a father like the heavenly father can you think of a mother i mean reasonable mother i mean a christian mother i mean a mother that really has the mind of christ persecuting her own daughter can you think of a family persecuting the family i mean normal family christian family can you think of disciples persecuting disciples no that's why jesus said if the world hates you it's the world that will hate the church it's the unbeliever that persecutes the believer it's the fleshly man that persecutes the spiritual man if the world hates you ye know that it hated me before it hated you if ye were the world the world will love his own even the people of the world they love their own they, they help one another and if we're children of god we're better than the world we'll not persecute one another it says it's the world if the world if you are the world the world will love his own but because ye are not of the world but i have chosen you out of the world therefore the world hates you remember the word that i said unto you the servant is not greater than his lord if they have persecuted me not if you have persecuted me how can john persecute christ is always leaning on his bosom 
How can Peter persecute Christ? It's always saying, if that's you on the water, bid me to come unto you on the water. No, it cannot be. But if the world, if they in the world, if they have hated me and persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my says, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Because they know not him that sent me. That's the reason actually why they persecute. We're looking at First Peter chapter 1. In First Peter chapter 1, we're reading from verse 6. First Peter chapter 1 verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The reason why you are persecuted as a child of God is that your faith has been tried. Chapter 3 verse 14. First Peter chapter 3 verse 14. But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake. Remember it's for righteousness sake. If ye suffer for righteousness sake. Happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror. Neither be troubled. Be not afraid of their terror. Be not afraid of their terror. Uh, that's one thing the devil wants to do. Uh, the devil wants you to be afraid. And the Lord said, you are not to be afraid. Number one, when you are, when you are going through persecution, understand the Lord has passed through the same thing. So number one, do not fear. Do not fear. Number two, do not fight. You know, the devil would like to point at something in your life and say, you too, you fought. You too, you got angry. You too, you retaliated. You too, you replied. Yes, they did bad. They did wrong. But you did wrong too. So, number one, do not fear. Number two, do not fight. Number three, do not fly or flee. Fly or flee. Now, you see, uh, I, I, you might have come across this before. Flight or fight. Whenever somebody attacks you, when, it, when I say attack, doesn't mean that they slap you. Maybe they attack you by insult, or they attack you by abuse, or they attack you by contradicting you, or they attack you by opposing you, or they attack you by, you know, just doing something and saying something that, uh, you know, that they are at you. They, it's like if you're afraid, you, you fight or you fly. Flight or fight. But don't do that. Number, just, just remain calm and understand you know when you know it's coming you know if you, if you know if you didn't know it's coming you'll be surprised but when you know something is coming jesus said you'll be persecuted the persecution will come the misunderstanding will come the opposition will come therefore it will not take you by surprise since you know it will come get ready number one do not fear number two do not fight number three do not fly do not flee number number four do not faint do not faint don't allow that to depress you and to make you dejected and to make you discouraged and then to be singing i'm not alone i'm not alone uh, Jesus is with me. I'm not alone. And you know, you know the reality. When you're saying I'm not alone, you're feeling you're alone. And then you say it's not an easy road. It's not an easy road. This Christian life is not an easy road. What does it make it easy? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Carry your burden to the Lord and leave it there. And when you carry your burden to the Lord and leave it there, then you're free. And uh, you know you are free as the Lord who has set you free. And you know when you are singing that kind of song every time, not an easy road, not an easy road. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, it, sometimes in the valley, sometimes on the mountain. Uh, those Negro spirituals. When, when you are singing those things every time, you make yourself more sad. But you will not fade. You say, Lord, here am I. Greater is He, is He that is in me, than He that is in the world. All things work together. 
for good. For those who are called of God, for those who are chosen by Him, those who love God, they are called according to His purpose. And in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who has loved us and I can do all things through Christ who loved me and he gave himself for me. You will look at the promises of God and which you will never leave, you will never forsake you. And no man shall be able to stand before you. A thousand shall fall at that side and ten thousand on the other side. Only with your eyes will you see the reward of, of the wicked. Because you set your love upon me, I will hear you, I will honor you, I will exalt you when you call upon me, I will hear with long life, will I satisfy him and show him my salvation get on the positive side of life and get away from that self pity i'm not alone of course you are not alone i said you are not alone and so number one what's number one do not fear what's number two do not fight what's number three do not fly or flee what's number four do not faint and what's number five do not fall don't allow anything to push you down and make you fall. Uh, you know, uh, you know what uh, persecution does. Uh, what persecution does is that it lifts up your leg. Uh, look up here, and those uh, who are watching over satellite, I'm sure you are looking. You, know, you lift up one leg like this. If anybody comes and then pushes you because you are standing on one leg, uh, you know the leg of self pity, and you are resting the other leg. Uh, you are not stable. Anybody can push you down. But if you stood like this with your two feet. And you know somebody is coming and you're ready and he wants to push you and then he pushes you and then as he's pushing like this this way you are resisting and he says this one this one is tough okay go your way <laughs> praise the lord Amen. and so you will not fall and you will not fall Amen. and then number six do not forsake the lord do not forsake the Lord. Uh, because of the persecution, there are people that will just give it up. They forsake, the, they forget their commitment to the Lord. Number seven, do not be frustrated. Do not be frustrated. Do not allow anything to ever frustrate you. It tells us in that passage, when persecution comes, where to stand. It says, let me read that verse 14 again. But, but and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason or of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Have been a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you and, or, and uh, as of evil doers, they may by uh, they may be ashamed uh, that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. We now come to point number three: the profit of persecuted children of God. The profit of persecuted children of God. I pray that all the persecution you go through will become profitable in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter five. In Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading to you from verse 12. Rejoice, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets which were before you. The Lord is telling us that when persecution comes, instead of regretting that you became a Christian, and instead of renouncing the Lord because of the persecution, you actually rejoice. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter 4, I'm reading to you from verse 14. It tells us in verse 14, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundance of grace might through the, through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, because of the glory that is coming we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding uh, weight, ex a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Here it says, our light affliction, our light affliction, 
uh, would you look up here for a moment as you look at what you have gone through since you became a Christian? I know when you're talking to your wife, you know, it's like, you know, a heavy body. My wife, uh, let, let's see that. Let, let's, let's talk about history. Uh, since I became a Christian, I went through this. I went through this. I went through. I know when you're talking to your husband. My husband, before you married me, and uh, you know i became a christian uh, did i did not tell you before um, I, you know i went through this i went through this i went through this and when you are talking together like that it looks like heavy heavy thing you've gone through for the lord great persecution and i know when you are talking to your intimate friend after you have you know you become a christian and now you are persecuted and then you came out of it say my friend you know I, did i tell you what i went through i went through this i went through this i went through and becomes a great great problem but i want you to do not forget that you've spoken to your wife or your husband or your you know, or your friends now let's come and and let's talk to paul the apostle and then you say paul the apostle you became a christian and then you give your life to the lord and he says yes and i should have given my life to the lord oh and paul the apostle said since you gave your life to the lord what did you go through my daddy beat me when because i became a christian uh, what else uh, they said that they will not uh, buy clothes for me because of this and that what else they called me holy mary what else they they said uh, jesus the prophet pastor they called me names what else uh, there was one day they actually almost slapped me did they slap you they didn't but they almost okay paul said thank you very much let me tell you my own I was imprisoned. They stoned me and left me for dead. They bound my hand and they bound my feet. Watch. And then all of them shouted and threw, threw dust on their head and said, Catch him, catch him, kill him. This man is not free to live. Uh, is that a, not only that they tied me to a post and they gave me 39 lashes i almost died and you see all the marks in my body and then when paul has finished talking then you say say what do you call your own persecution say our light affliction our light affliction everything you have gone through since you were born again all the insults all the persecution, all the abuse, all the denial, all the things who are counting as heavy and heavy. It's our light affliction. I thank God you have not got much more than you have got. If you have got much more than that, what should you have done? Stop saying that you are going through a lot. You are not going through anything. Now it's easy life. And we thank the Lord. The Lord already has borne the heavy part of the load. And what we are going through is just a light affliction. Verse 17, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, and the, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I pray that now we'll come to this new understanding. And then this load will be lighter in Jesus' name. Amen. And in fact, the Lord is preparing us for something great and we'll experience it in Jesus' name. Amen. In Romans chapter 8 verse 28. Romans 8 verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose everything in your life will work for good yeah. now when you go through persecution what do you do number one require or request require or request that means you are praying you are requiring for more grace more understanding you are requiring for more you, you are requesting for more stability in your christian life that this persecution will not push you to say what you shouldn't say or to do what you shouldn't do number two rely rely on the lord the lord is by your side rely on the promises of god when you are going through the persecution number one request or require number two rely on the lord number three receive receive the grace of god because if you will trust the Lord, there is enough grace in, from the hand of the Lord to make you what you ought to be. Number four, rejoice. Rejoice. And, and you see, you cannot, you cannot do two things at the same time. You cannot smile and be angry at the same time. 
you cannot smile and be regretting at the same time you cannot smile and be depressed at the same time you cannot smile and then be so sorrowful dejected as if you should kill yourself at the same time make an effort to smile just smile and that depends on you you can smile if you want to smile and just remember something what was the happiest day of your life what was something that really turned you on and really made you happy just say you know you sit down let's say you're getting persecuted and you see what the devil wants to do for you is to make you concentrate on that persecution concentrate on that injury concentrate on that pain but if you just turn your mind away from that pain and uh, this year what, what has been the best day for me what really happened that made me so happy that i belong to the lord and then you recall that scene then you might even want to close your eyes and see that picture in front of you and see yourself as if you are seeing yourself on the screen of a, of a film show and you see yourself in that happy mode identify with that happiness and rejoice and look overlook this present thing that is going on now number four therefore rejoice number five renew renew your consecration renew your commitment unto the lord number six reject any suggestion that is saying you are miserable you're unfortunate you're unlucky look at yourself reject all that kind of self-pity number seven rest rest in the lord and the lord will bring, bring you through Amen. let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer the lord is telling us tonight there's nothing to be sorry about there's nothing to be sorrowful about to a child of god and even though there might be persecution look away from that and look at things that should contribute to the joy of your life look at things that will contribute to you wanting to move forward wanting to move on because of the great things the lord has done which he still promises to do as well in your own personal life remember as a child of god you're a peacemaker as a child of god you love peace you rejoice when there is peace. You influence other people to be peaceful with one another as a child of God. And Jesus is our model. The model of the peacemaker. Make him your model. Looking unto Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith looking unto him when there's conflict confusion contention animosity hatred malice disagreement anywhere go in there and be like jesus and be a peacemaker get involved in this ministry of peacemaking make it a lifestyle do it every time just have joy in reconciling people together and reconciling people with the almighty god preaching to sinners witnessing to them calling them be ye reconciled unto god get involved in the ministry of peacemaking every action let it influence others to love one another let it influence others to love to live to love the Lord and to love the people of God let your message be a message of the peacemaker. We are brethren. We shouldn't fight. We are brethren. We shouldn't hate one another. We are brethren. We shouldn't make life inconvenient for anyone. The message of the peacemaker. Mediation 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 by the peacemaker be like jonathan 
reconciling Saul with David. Mediate. Let that be the motive of your speech. The motive of your interaction with people. Mediation. At the mind of the peacemaker. Let the peace of God that passes understanding rule in your heart. Establish peace in your own family. Be at peace with your wife. Be at peace with your husband. Be at peace with your children. Whatever you know you will say that will disturb the peace of the family, don't say it. Whatever you know you'll do that will disturb the peace of your children, the peace of your father, the peace of your mother, the peace of your husband, your wife, then don't say it. At the mind of the peacemaker. And the message of peacemakers. I will not cross to your side to come and harm you. You will not cross to my side to come and harm me. The message of the peacemaker. You think the best of other people. Do the best for other people. Encourage other people to be their best and to love to live. The message of the peacemaker. Avoid the mistakes in peacemaking. Don't allow any antichrist to deceive you by any false peace. Don't allow anyone having the spirit of the antichrist to lure you to any covenant by their deception which is based on false peace and I receive more of the grace of God and you live in the grace of God to be a real peaceful child of God don't think the whole world is going to love you because of that the more you get into the spirit the more those in the flesh will oppose you contradict you oppress you persecute you Make up your mind not to fear. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Never fear. Never fight. Don't fight in attitude. Don't fight in action. Don't fight them with words. Don't show them anything. Just plain, loving, gentle child of God. Don't flee. Don't fly. Stay at the post of duty.
Don't faint. Don't allow discouragement. Cancel those songs of self-pity. I don't sing those songs anymore. Don't faint. Don't fall. And keep on standing for righteousness. Don't forsake the Lord. Don't forget your consecration. And not allow anything to frustrate you either. In the midst of that persecution, request for more grace. Rely on the unfailing promises of God. Receive more grace to be what you ought to be and rejoice and rejoice and rejoice rejoice in the Lord His mercy is so sweet renew your consecration before the Lord Reject the temptation to slow down the path of righteousness just because there is persecution. Rest in the Lord. Then the Lord will see you through. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted thee the prophets that were before you